Michael Moore is here. He is a journalist and documentary filmmaker who takes an unconventional look at America. Roger and Me, his 1989 landmark film about the downsizing effects by General Motors, is the highest grossing documentary of all time. In his latest film, Bowling for Columbine, he examines guns and violence in American society. Here is the trailer for the film. It's scathing, incendiary, hilarious, and provocative. Our children had turned into little monsters. But who was to blame? What were the suspects doing the morning of attack? I'd heard that they were bowling. Bowling for Columbine. Why wasn't anyone blaming bowling for warping their minds? A movie that will have you up in arms. Thank you for not shooting me. I am pleased to welcome Michael Moore back to this table. Welcome back and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're going to talk about the film Bowling for Columbine, but first I want to give you a chance. Uh, I just talked to George Will. You may have heard some of that conversation. Yes, I did. I imagine you have some differences. <laughs> where <laughs> do we start? A few. Okay, tell me where you come down on this. I mean, now George makes sense in some cases. Well, uh, no, I don't think he made no, any it, sense. It, there's no threat. I'm going to no, say there's no threat from... Here's, here's, here's the thing. Uh, in every great lie, and I believe there is the big lie being perpetrated on the American public by the Bush administration with this uh, weapons of mass destruction, et cetera, et cetera. But the best lies, the ones that work, have a strong kernel of truth to them. The big kernel of truth to this lie is that Saddam Hussein is a really bad guy. This is not a good guy. All right? and, and, Carl Lurie, he <clears throat> has and wants weapons of mass destruction. As do a lot of bad no, guys okay, right. in this world. Okay, but that's, that, the that, point is he has it. Yes. And wants it. I'm much more concerned that Pakistan has the bomb and India has the bomb, and they seem hell-bent on wanting to go after each other. To me, that's a much more threatening situation in terms of a potential nuclear war than whatever Saddam is up to now. And, and I cannot forget my history here. The history of this is that we supplied him with these weapons. We gave him $4 billion in aid during the 80s. We allowed biochemical uh, companies in the United States to supply him with the ingredients for these biological weapons in the 1980s. This is all in the 1994 Senate report that laid the whole sad story out. He gasses the Kurds in 1984. What do we do a year later in November of 85? We restore full diplomatic relations with Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And that is the issue that I would like to address. I don't believe, and I don't believe Bush has shown us the credible evidence the way Kennedy did 40 years ago this week. You know, those pictures that he had the other night, uh, last night on the, you know, that is not the same as Kennedy saying, here's the missile, and there it is. Yeah. <laughs> there's the missile silo. There it is. You know, I, I just, you know, Look, you and I, we live in New York City. Uh, I think if you talk to most New Yorkers, I mean, there's a sense that the sh other shoe hasn't dropped yet. You know, the world, we're all in this kind of tension we've been in for the last year. What's the next thing that's going to happen to us? And what's being done about that? Do you, Charlie Rose, feel any safer a year later than you did, you know, after 9-11 uh, last year? I do, actually. You do? I in do. this city? Yes, I do. Well, I mean, I, no, I may be the first one you've ever met. Yeah, well, I no, I, I want what you have then, because I no. personally don't feel that no, way. No, I, do I believe that it's possible that we could have another serious attack against New York City, this place that I live and love right. and, and most of my friends live? Yes. Do I think it's possible? Do I think we're safer than we were a year ago, I do. Yeah. I think we're safer because they've uncovered lots of plots. They know a whole lot about them, and, and a number of them are on the run. So right. I think we are in a better place than we were. Okay. We're not in a safe place. We're okay. not in a totally secure place, right. but we're in a better place. Yeah, but, not, but better isn't good enough for me. Well, me either. I mean, uh, but I don't think there's ever a perfect. I don't think that we can totally... You know. But why aren't our energies going down that well, road I think instead, they of, are. instead of Saddam Hussein? Saddam Hussein is not going to hurt you or I today or tomorrow sitting here in New York City. Well, so, so well, why? Well, take George Will's hypothesis. Yeah. How do you know that, that if, in fact, I mean, suppose the Israelis had not done what they did. He, he was very close mm -hmm. to developing a mm -hmm. nuclear weapon mm -hmm. and might very well have used it in a bloody war against the Iranians. Right. Right. Might have used it if we tried to thwart his march into Kuwait right. and have occupied Kuwait and said, look, I just want Kuwait, I'm not going to Saudi Arabia, and you know I've got a bomb, and stop right there. Right. He right. might have done that. <clears throat> right. Now, does that argument have any weight Yes, with it you? does. Yes, it does. Absolutely. Yeah. I, think if, I think if you can prove that somebody is up to doing something like that, that you have every right to act in self-defense to stop him from
from doing that. But, but George Will and others, and I think the President Trump, have laid that out as they see it. Now, uh, you may no. say it hasn't proven it to you, no, but they, they have laid it out. It hasn't proven it to most Americans. It's still today, the poll shows, yeah. he only gets 46% of the public backing a unilateral war against well, Iraq. It's an the majority of Americans yeah. are not behind this yet. I, I don't disagree with you that. And, and, and I don't think, and I hope they won't be. Yeah, listen to this. This is uh, the lead story in the Washington Post about Bush. And, and I was caught by this sentence. This is like the fourth paragraph by Karen DeYoung. Bush spoke in a televised speech aide said was scheduled so that he could explain his Iraqi policy directly to the American people. Although it seems likely that the resolution Bush seeks will pass both houses of Congress by the end of the week, polls show that public support is waning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what you believe. That's right. That's, that's the what more I we believe. learn about this, the more we, the le less we support it. That's right. That's right. Because because nobody people trust their own common sense, and and nobody feels that their lives are being threatened by this. For those who oppose the war, as you do, right? You know, how do you define the threat of Saddam Hussein, and what would you believe reasonable to do about the threat? Uh -huh. I don't honestly think it's a threat. I don't think that this guy is a threat to me or to anybody I know. I think this is all a distraction. I think, I think he's no more of a threat now than he was uh, 10 months ago or 20 months ago. And this has all come up now. And I think this is a gut feeling that most people have about this, is that there's an election coming up. And, and, and uh, you know, th this is, a, uh, I think Bush is really in trouble. I, I think the, the people are enraged by what's happened with the economy. Uh, look, in the 20 months he's, he's, he's taken office, the stock market is down 35 percent, two million less jobs. Mm -hmm. We had a budget surplus okay. of, you know, the whole litany of things. Litany, I mean, yeah, everyone I, knows that they're living I, it, you I, know? I, I, I don't think the dot-com, <laughs> the, the fact that all the dot-com implosion took place and the stock market took place uh, because of the telecom overcapacity is necessarily in any particular administration's fault. Oh, I agree with that. Oh, absolutely. But but you know, Clinton's gone, so we'll leave it him alone. It may be some other greedy. <laughs> it may be some other greedy people's fault. But, right. Right. But, but 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 for the average American who was convinced to put their money into the stock market, yeah. you know, because they saw the wealth, the wealthy people got. Boy, they did really great during the '90s. Right. You know, so maybe I should invest my own personal savings into this. How many billions have been lost? Just average Americans who've lost this uh, in the last few years. It's, it's, it's. I'm telling you, people are just they're looking for a reason to, to, mm. to, to uh, get their revenge. And I think the revenge will come at the expense of the Republicans on November 5th. I, I believe very strongly in this. And that, Bush, that the, I think the Bush, Democrats will win control of the House. You believe? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, have, they have the potential to. I mean, the Democrats are are great for uh, blowing it and, and and knowing how to. Did you read <laughs> Tom Friedman's column over the weekend? Yeah, right. You know, then. Headline was where the Democrats. Where are they? Yeah. Where are, hello? You know, yeah. <laughs> where did they go? You know, at, at, there's 435. To raise all those issues that he said, and Tom Friedman's agreeing with you yeah. in this particular case that the American public is more concerned about all these other issues. He went out on a book tour promoting his book, uh -huh. and that's what I did too. And, and, and he I'm, says 47 cities I went to. That's all, all I heard they talked people. about that's were right. these domestic issues. That's exactly more. Right. Not that they didn't mention the war, but there was a much more prevalent interest in what's happening to them in terms of their savings, in terms of their 401ks, in terms of prescription drugs, in terms of their health benefits, in terms of education and violence. That's right. That's exactly right. That's, and, and if they're concerned about terrorism, the question is, what happened to the original mission? Where is Osama bin well, Laden? I, that's my question for you. Where do you stand on that mission against terrorism and the effort to get well, Osama bin Laden? That's a good mission. To find Osama bin Laden and bring him to justice? If he's the one that, that committed this act, and it, it appears that he's the one who did it, absolutely, absolutely. But again, we should have been doing our job. Again, I hate to like go back into history right. a bit because, but none of these events operate in a vacuum. What's been the most radicalizing event or person on your mindset about the way the world works? Hmm. About the way the world works? Yeah, or, or the way the United States works. I mean, what you've just been described. Or the establishment works. I mean, what has shaped you and your political thought? Um, certainly Vietnam. Certainly civil yeah, rights. Yeah. Certainly. Well, uh, I, probably most importantly were the, uh, the parents I was raised by. I was yeah. raised in an Irish Catholic home in Flint, and, Michigan. In Flint, Michigan, um, by working class parents, and uh, and the lessons that that they and the good sisters uh, uh, taught me while I was growing up. Um, uh, resonate with me uh, to this day uh, that uh, we will be judged by how we treat the least among us. Uh, that a rich man will have a more difficult time getting into heaven than a camel will have getting through the eye of a needle. I mean, these are the, yeah, the lessons that we were we were yeah. taught, and and I believe that there was a lot of truth to that. And 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 
And, and I remember certain things as a child. I remember Holy Thursday um, Mass in 1968, coming out of Mass. It's April 4th, 1968. And uh, one of the parents had gone to the car to warm it up or whatever and turned the radio on, and a bulletin came on, and, and he hears the bulletin, and he shouts out to the others of us coming out of, out of Mass, They've just shot Martin Luther King! And a cheer goes up amongst many of the people that were coming out of church. Wow. And as a 13-year-old, I was... I, I couldn't understand why anybody would would cheer uh, the killing of another person. I, mean, I wasn't a political person then or whatever. I wasn't that aware of civil rights or whatever, but I just... I, I didn't understand. That. And we just were coming out of Mass. Tomorrow's Good Friday. You know, what... It was. It was just. It, it, um, it things like that. I guess they just. They just sort of stuck in my in my head and through my life. And 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 what my parents always taught me about injustice and and doing the right thing and and standing up for what you believe in and following your conscience. And so uh, all of that had great impact on me. And then we lived in a time where nine boys that went to my high school came back in in a coffin From with Vietnam. a flag draped over it. And uh, yeah, and and I think, and because I love this country, and because I want it to be better, and I think it can be better, uh, I've learned that the most patriotic thing to do is to always question what's going on, to never accept or believe uh, what is you know what is being what said. Yeah. Uh, George Seldes, I don't know if you remember him, uh, yeah. was a, a muckraking journalist right, from right, the forties and the fifties. Uh, had this great uh, uh, a quote. Uh, he, he he said that all governments are run by liars, and nothing they say should be believed. And and that's that's sort of that was his ethos of journalism. That he you know that you always they have to prove to you yeah. that they're telling the truth. Yeah. I, there's another ad, the caveat to that is that we ought to always be skeptical, but not necessarily cynical. Oh, I I agree with that, and I'm not a cynic. Yeah. I'm not. I'm actually a very optimistic uh, person. I, I I believe that. That the skepticism, uh, if applied properly, uh, can actually move people and, and affect change, and things can get better. All right, let's roll tape here. We'll get back to Charlton Heston in a moment. This is where Michael opened the bank account in a bank. So, so, in Michigan. In Michigan, so that he can get a free gun, because they got 500 of them in the vault? In the vault, yes. All right, here it is. What the crime? Oh, with a crime. Okay, so if I'm just normally mentally defective, yeah. but not criminal. Exactly. There you go, Mike. Okay, thank you very much. Wow. I have one personally. That's a nice action. It is, and it's nice. you got a one straight one. shooter. It's a straight shooter, let me tell you. Wow. Sweet. Well, here's my first question. Do you think it's a little dangerous handing out guns in a bank? Uh, that should repeat the question. You were saying to him, don't you think it's a little dangerous to have so many guns in a bank? Right. And he said, <laughs> no. No. <laughs> um, so, so you're off. You got a gun in a bank. Yeah. Right. And what is this just, this is the point to be made here, is that it's so easy. That's right. To get it, a gun. It's, it's, it's so easy, and, and we can't see the insanity of, of, of this. Uh, there were so many things like that we found in the research for the film. I mean, schools that would have auctions to raise money for the schools or, or raffle yeah. sales, and they'd be raffling off a gun at the school. You know, it's like, doesn't anybody get this? It's, it's, it was just bizarre. All right, here is Marilyn Manson in the conversation about guns and violence. He was blamed, right, for yeah. Columbine. Okay, here right. it is. The fear and consumption, and that's what I think that it's all based on, is the whole idea that keep everyone afraid and they'll consume. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really right. as simple as it can be boiled down to. Right. If you were to talk directly to the, to the kids at Columbine or the people in that community, what, what, would, what would you say to them if they were here right now? I wouldn't say a single word to them. I would listen to what they have to say, and that's what no one did. What did you discover when you visited Littleton? <clears throat> well, you know, it's hard to go there. It's, you feel real bad for the community. It's, uh, it's a tough thing, you know, for them to have to go through. Um, the scariest thing about it is that it is so normal. It is so much like every other suburb. There's yeah. nothing wrong or bad about Littleton you know, or weirdly different that this tragedy would occur there. That's what makes it more scary, that it literally could happen yeah. anywhere. These kids were honor students. They were skipping their Eastern philosophy class when they started the shooting. Um, uh, it, it, but then I, I asked one of the parents, I said, what, what, who's the biggest employer here in Littleton? What's the number one you know, private employer? Lockheed Martin, the world's largest weapons maker. 
is the number one employer in Littleton. And so I, I went to Who's see Who's Lockheed that. Martin make? Uh, well, they made the MX missile. Right. Uh, they're very much involved in now the new Star Wars uh, uh, program. And, uh, and so I went there um, and spoke to the people there, the executives. Uh, do you see any kind of connection here between, you know, the sort of all these forms of violence that exist in our society, including yours? And uh, they said, oh, of course not. You know, we, as Americans, we don't use these missiles or these bombs that we make or these bombers to just, you know, react in anger like these kids did. We don't just go after somebody because we don't like them. Well, of course, that's exactly what we have done. And then I show in the film a whole history from uh, Mossadegh in Iran, who we helped to overthrow, right. democratically elected president. Right. Then the next year, that's right, Arbenz in Guatemala, democratically elected, we overthrew CIA. him. That's right. We helped to assassinate, and we, or I should say we approved the assassination of ZM in South Vietnam. That then opened up and led to that conflict. Kennedy administration. Was, Kennedy administration. You go on and on and on this history. Pinochet, uh, Allende, September 11th, 1973, uh, our involvement in that coup. Again, a democratically elected president. I mean, th this is the rap we have, you know, around the world, and, and I don't like that. I don't want to be but there known is as, also as somebody I, who I, I supports agree, that and funds that with my tax dollars. We also have a very good rap around the world, Absolutely. Too. People and, you know, love Americans. Say, no, that's, that's very know, really true. true. They do. No, they do. They love us as people. Well, they love the and values that, that they love a lot of the values that they believe. And the ideals that we have. Exactly. The American dream. Exactly. But my point is, in this film and the, the other right. things that I've done, is that I don't want that American dream to be just a dream. I want it to be a reality for us and for the people that, that we share this planet with. All right. Let me just make one last point because I'm out of time. The two points I want to make. One, so you go see Charlton Heston. Yes. You know, who's by then head of the NRA, right? Yes. You go to his house. Yes. You have a conversation with him. Yes. He ends the interview. Yes, he walks out on of me, his own out, house. Out of his own house. Now, what is it you said that's so infuriating? Well, he thought I was there to have a gun control debate with him. And basically, I was saying to him, you know, I, I kind of agree with you. Guns don't kill people. People right, kill right. people. Except I would alter it to guns don't kill people. Americans yeah, And kill you're people. not anti-hunting and all that. Not anti-hunting. And the right to defend yourself. And, and I, just, I just said to him, but why did you go to Columbine? Why did you go to Denver 10 days after that massacre and have that big pro-gun rally? You know, it just rubbing people's nose in it. And then in my hometown of Flint, Michigan, a little six-year-old boy shot a six-year-old girl to death in school. And he a few months later shows up there to have a big rally and 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 you know just here we are and we don't care you know and it's like why do you do that I mean don't you think you deserve these people deserve an apology from you and he says you want me to apologize to the people of Flint and Columbine and just gets up and he he walks out and uh, you know um, but what he, it's what he says before that that I think is what people are going to find very stunning. Because I ask him why the difference between us and Canada. And he said? He says, the problem in America is our mixed ethnicity. And I, said, I said, our mixed ethnicity? And, he, and then he catches himself and he goes, well, I don't want to go there. We had enough problems with civil rights. And uh, it's a very chilling uh, moment, the, the, the way that he interjects race. But, it, but it, it connects to much of the rest of the film in terms of our culture of fear and how race is used in that and how, you know, Charlie, the central question that I'm asking here is that if we can't, our American ethic, you know, the way that we look at and build our society here, if we won't even guarantee that our children can have a doctor if they get sick, we won't, put, we won't even have universal health care for our kids. If we would do that to our own children, what would we do to the children of Iraq or any place else? This is what I want to change. I want us to be better. I want us to aspire to something a bit better than that. And I think in doing so, we'll create a less violent society here at home. And, and we will not export this violence anymore around the world. And we will not train and fund nutcases like Saddam or Osama bin Laden, who eventually come back to harm us in, in, in very tragic ways. Bowling for Columbine opens October 11th in New York and L.A. and nationally on October 18th and 24th. Uh, the 11th, the 18th, and the 25th. Somewhere there you'll somewhere find, there you'll find a theater. Somewhere there you'll find a theater somewhere there. Michael Moore, who speaks his mind uh, through books and through film uh, about the way he sees the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.